maybe just to begin, um, what I'm kind of keen on wrapping up this course slowly. Uh, so there'll be today, there'll be one more lecture um, explaining the end of the proof. So we'll kind of get halfway towards the Archipop is recovering off theorem this week. And then next week I will explain um, Whittaker sheaves and we will finish the proof. At least, you know, as you've understood by now, things are becoming more sketchy. So we'll finish the sketch of the proof next week. Um, the week after that, I had plan, I plan on giving um, a lecture about the Hecker category and Zergel biomodules. Um, and a little bit of a discussion of um, central sheaves in the context of Zogel biomodules. And then I thought um, I'll try to plan one more lecture in which I at least state uh, Bezor Kamnikov's equivalence um, correctly or with, with all definitions, um, and then probably give some kind of high level overview of its proof. Uh, so that's a rough plan. It can be uh, changed um, if there's significant interest from the or from you guys. Uh, so just let me know. But that's that's a rough outline. Uh, okay. So today is basically we're spending it in the land of uh, Wakimoto sheaves. So this is affine flags. If my handwriting is worse than usual, it's because I'm a little bit cold. Um, I had this stupid idea of just having a cold shower. Affine braids. And Wakimoto sheaves. Okay, so last time... We explained how the braid group of the finite vial group maps to the Hecker category or to the um, to equivariant sheaves on the flag variety. And this maps uh, sigma x, so this is a positive lift of x in wf to delta x inside here. Uh, and we saw several properties of this. And this braid group, the fact that this braid group kind of sits inside the Hecker category is of fundamental importance in geometric representation theory. Uh, so we've touched on some of the nice aspects of it, but certainly haven't exhausted it. So now uh, there's essentially no difference to um, in the affine case. So I just want to go over that briefly. So affine case we consider FLE, which is affine flags. And this is I is the Iwahori. And remember that um, W is the affine file group. So this is defined to be the co-character lattice of our maximal torus, uh, semi-directed finite file group. And this is the uh, extended affine vowel group. And for simplicity, let us assume in this lecture that um, 
G is simply connected. So that W is a Coxeta group. Remember that in general, it's what we call a quasi Coxeta group or so it's a Coxeta group with some automorphisms. Uh, but that's, that just adds technicalities um, that are not substantial, but uh, I just want to make this assumption. Yeah. And um, And the, exactly the same construction gives us uh, the affine Bray group sits inside the the same construction. Okay, there's no no difference um, with the finite case. Okay, so it's been a little while, so I just want to remember. Um, so, so B W is is defined. Using W S. Okay, so W S has a Coxeta presentation, and then we define the braid group by just forgetting the back that our generator square to one. So this is very much in the world of Coxeta groups. Um, so, and we've seen repeatedly that kind of uh, the, the Coxeta group presentation is what is adapted to the constructible side, whereas the loop presentation is what is adapted to the coherent side. So, what we want to do is imitate to some limited extent um, the loop presentation of the Ray group. So I just want to review the Bernstein generators. Okay, so we've seen this before. I just want to go over it um, very briefly again. We have um, lemma 11.8 in the notes, which is this beautiful, so Peter asked a question. I thought that the map from braid to constructible Hecker category required a theorem of Deline that was finite type only. Uh, I don't think that Deline's, I think that Deline's theorem is true for any Coxeter group. Um, in fact, I'm sure that it's true for any Coxeter group. I'm just not sure that his proof works for any Coxeter group. Um, but definitely there's an argument. Um, yeah, so the statement of Deline's theorem is true for any Coxeter group. Thank you for the question. Um, Okay, so we there's this beautiful formula for the length in the in an affine vial group, which is if we take something that's a product of a translation. So this is a translation. And this is in the finite vial group. Then this is a sum over roots. Um, over positive roots that W uh, keeps positive. Plus the sum over roots 
that W makes negative. Uh, and then we just have the absolute value of lambda alpha. Uh, and if this theorem means nothing to you, um, tr I guess the, the uh, one very nice way of thinking about this theorem is in the kind of alcove picture. Um, so maybe, I, I mean, I think I said at the time that it's really nice, think, we, we gave a proof of this theorem at the time, but it's really nice to think about this theorem um, in the, um, in the alcove picture. Uh, but one thing to note about this theorem is that if lambda is, um, so a consequence is that if lambda and gamma have fixed sign with every root, in other words, they live in the same uh, chamber, then the lengths of the products add. So in particular, if lambda against every positive root is um, positive, so if lambda and lambda prime are in the um, are in the dominant uh, dominant co-roots, then the length add. And then we get, um, so this implies that in the Hecker algebra, if we take our standard basis elements corresponding to these guys. So remember in general, we expect a very complicated formula for this, but if lambda and lambda prime are dominant, then this is just the same thing as lambda plus lambda prime. So they commute. And the product is very simple. And so this says the, um, so then the Bernstein generators So we have this monoid map to H star that maps lambda to lambda dominant to okay. and the way that we do this is for lambda in Chi check arbitrary. Write uh, lambda equals lambda prime minus lambda double prime with lambda prime, lambda double prime uh, dominant. So we can express any weight or any co weight as a difference of dominant co weights. And then we define theta lambda to be dt lambda dt. Okay. This is and so this is how we get our Bernstein generators. And then Bernstein goes on to explain, so this gives us this gives us a map from Z B plus or minus one. Guy check to H 
And then Bernstein explains that the W invariance inside here is exactly the center of the Hecker algebra. Okay. So now we want to uh, lift this up to sheaves. So we want to know what are the analog of the Bernstein generators in the, um, in the Hecker category. And one way of kind of thinking about that is to notice that, that the ones for the positive braids make perfect sense. Okay, so uh, these ones, these guys make perfect sense. These are the images of the braid group. And so we basically imitate this construction on the level of sheets. So wacky moto. Okay, so um, IE. So somehow I don't think it it's particularly difficult to come up with this, de this definition. It's more difficult to kind of realize how, how nice these objects are. Uh, so we write, so given lambda inside chi, so given a co-weight, we write And we define J lambda, so I'm copying uh, Roman's notation, to be um, nabla T lambda convolved with delta T um, Sorry. Okay, so, and this is the same thing as, remember that before that we see the standard basis is categorified by the deltas, this is the same thing as delta T lambda, delta T lambda double prime. Okay, and this thing is called a wacky moto sheaf. Sorry, Jordi, did you already mention why it's called wacky moto? Like, what is a relation, like some construction of by wacky moto related? So I think that if you take, I think, emphasis on I think, um, if you take these things, regard them as D modules on the affine flag variety and take their global sections, you get wacky moto modules to affine Lie algebras. I feel like saying, setting an essay topic, discuss. Um, yeah, so that may or may not be true. But I think that that's certainly, so this definition is, as far as I understand, um, it due to Merkovich. And I think that Merkovich um, was motivated by wacky moto modules in making this definition. And I must admit that I don't really know what a wacky moto module is. Um, so this is a wacky moto sheaf and just example,
if lambda is dominant, then J lambda is delta lambda. If lambda is anti-dominant, J lambda is Nabla of lambda. And in some sense for lambda not anti-dominant or dominant, it's a mix, but it's a mix of the standard and co-standard in some sense. Um, lemma. Is that the map lambda goes to J lambda extends to a map from the monodal category associated to the co characters to D to the what we're roughly thinking about as being the Hecke category, so it's a slight Hecke approximation of the Hecke category. Um, hence, so this monoidal category you can see as being precisely the one dimensional objects in rep T check. It's equivalent to the category. So, you know, this is a kind of generators and relations description of the um, monoidal category rep T check. Okay, because every representation is one dimensional. Every irreducible representation is one dimensional and they tensor in various, um, various um, easy ways. And so, so um, any kind of, any functor to an additive category extends to rep T. So hence we, obtain a tensor functor rep t check um, and an easy adaption So last week, what we saw that delta x tensored nabla y is perverse for all x and y. And here, when we form this Wakimoto thing, what we're doing is just doing a, a delta tensor nabla in the affine setting. We're doing a special case of a delta tensor and nabla. And so the same argument gives you that that's perverse. So um, this gives lemma. J lambda actually is, um, is perverse. So the wacky boto sheaves are perverse sheaves. Um, So now notation. And part of this notation will um, be become clear in a second. A is, so one should think about these as something like kind of standard objects. And so it's natural to consider the category of Wakimoto filtered objects in reverse sheaves. And then, um, so this notation will become clear in about a slide why it makes sense. So Gruer A is the essential 
image of uh, rep T check in DBI FLIR. Um, but so by essential image, I mean I take every object, I mean, look, maybe I should just say an image of rep T. So this is not a full subcategory. So as we'll say in a, see in a moment, there is, um, there's many morphisms between the images of these wacky moto sheaves. For, so there's morphisms from J lambda to J mu, when lambda is not equal to mu. Uh, I'll answer in a second, Peter. So there's, there's morphisms from, um, from, the, from J lambda to J mu when lambda is not equal to mu. And these, these are not considered as morphisms in Gura R. Okay. And as I said before, um, the notation Gura R will make sense in a few minutes. Um, and it's note So I wanted to do this as an exercise, but then I couldn't, um, I couldn't prove it myself. Um, so I suspect that there's no interesting um, monoidal subcategories of equivariant perverse sheaves on finite player varieties. So basically, when you start convolving things, things become, unless they're very, very boring subcategories, then things become not perverse. Whereas here in the affine case, we have this really remarkable, rich um, subcategory A and this smaller su subcategory Grua A, which are monoidal categories of equivariant perversions. So another thing that we saw in the case of finite um, is that there's nice home vanishing properties between these. So, so we saw between standard and like the standard objects and co-standard objects form exceptional collections and the wacky moto sheaves also do. So, so in finite, in the finite case, Um, nabla x to nabla y is zero unless um, x is less than y. So here I have y is less than x. So this should be very easy with the junctions every time I have to think about it. Okay, looks right. Um, so now the analog of this is the following lemma, which is that hom from J lambda to J mu equals zero and less lambda is less than mu. And this is the, um, the kind of usual order on weights. It's um, probably making things way too complicated. I think about it as periodic order. 
i.e. mu minus lambda is the sum of positive co-roots. And the other thing that's important is that the degree zero homomorphisms from J lambda to J lambda is just Q. Proof. So HOM dot from J lambda to J mu is the same thing by a tensoring with some J gamma to HOM J lambda convolved with J gamma, J mu convolved with J gamma, which is HOM dot J lambda plus gamma, J mu plus gamma, and this is HOM dot from delta T lambda plus gamma, delta T mu plus gamma for gamma sufficiently dominant. Okay. One of the beautiful things of having, got it. We can do these things whenever we have a kind of pick up or like um, monodal categories in which every um, object is invertible. And we know that this is zero unless, I mean, we, I'm saying we know, but this is the imprecise and, and analog to the finite case with the same proofs and the proof is one line. Um, unless T lambda plus gamma is less than T mu plus gamma. And this is known, this is known to be the same as lambda plus gamma is less than mu plus gamma. So this is a known fact. Yeah. order. Namely, all I'm saying is that when the Bruja order on translations in the affine vial group agrees with this order if your translation is sufficiently dominant. So here I'm saying this is Bruja order and this is periodic order. The periodic order is um, periodic, i.e. We can remove gamma. Okay, so just to get a picture of this, we have the um, co weight lattice is Z alpha check, and then we have J zero, J alpha check, J2 alpha check, J minus alpha check, alpha check. And we have lots of complicated homes in this direction. And we have identities, but we have no homes back. Okay, and what these homes are is um, pretty, pretty complicated. Yeah, so you just want, you just want both of these, um, you just like, I, To 
give you another one. Okay, so our gamma depends on lambda and mu, but it depends on lambda and mu in a rather simple way. Uh, so now we come to, to an exercise, which is basically an exercise, like whenever you have such a, oh no. Whenever you have such a situation in which homs only go in one direction, um, and you look at objects which are filtered by these things, then they have a basically canonical filtration um, in which, so, um, in which the um, order of the factors goes the other way. Um, I'll explain what I mean by that in a second. So this lemma implies the following exercise. So, so Masuda asked, is the construction of Wakimoto object something that is sensible, useful in general highest weight categories? So this is a very good question. The answer is no, and I want to explain why. So let me, um, I'll come back to this slide in a second. I just want to explain the answer, what I think is the answer to Masud's question, because it's, um, it's important. So let's look at SL2 and let's look at the Bruja order. So, um, on the, so I'm looking, so W is generated by a finite simple reflection and an affine simple reflection. And this is what Bruja order looks like. So this is Bruja order. Now there's another very funny thing that we can do, which is to just um, to basically define a new order by looking arbitrarily far in this direction. So then we get a new order. So we get we get periodic order. And uh, the Bruja order is kind of the reflects the geometry of the affine flag variety, whereas periodic order reflects the geometry of the so-called so semi-infinite flag variety. Uh, now, this is what is the kind of order that comes to us when we are on the constructible side. This is this order reflects the geometry of Schubert cells on the flag variety. But if we're on the other side, if we're on co um, coherent sheaves on the cotangent bundle, we have line bundles um, which come from a put, come back by fire pull back from a point. And what I'll explain in a second is that these line bundles, I mean. This is obviously a periodic order. I can tensor by a line bundle. And I don't. I don't change anything. And so, this is this is the kind of order that that suits line bundles. And somehow, I would say that a lot of um, very beautiful constructions in Bezrek Kamnikov's work consist of working out clever ways of changing these orders, changing from one to the other. And this, I would say, would be the order that makes sense in a general highest weight category or something. This is the order that just comes to you. Whereas Wakimoto is special 
in the affine case in that we can change the order, that we have this, this generic or periodic type order. Thanks, Jordi. Um, maybe since you already gone to this tangent, I asked the follow-up, which was, is there a, somehow a characterization of Bakimoto sheaves as those perverse sheaves on affine flag satisfying some properties? That I don't know. So remember, we've just seen this lemma that the homes only go in one direction. Now, I really recommend doing this exercise. It's really, it's something that wasn't clear to me for quite a long time. For when people talk about um, standard or co-standard filtered objects in the highest weight category, you usually say that the standard filtration, there exists a standard filtration, but I don't think it's emphasized enough that this standard filtration is basically unique. And that's what this exercise is saying. Every F in, so any Wakimoto filtered equivariant perverse sheaf, but you can leave out all the, all the trickiness in this exercise. It's just an exercise about abelian cate categories um, so objects in abelian categories which admit certain filtrations by something belonging to an exceptional collection. This admits a unique. Filtration, and this is called, in this particular case, it's called the Wakimoto filtration. Fi, and this is not a filtration indexed by um, by the integers. It's indexed by um, upper closed sets. It's in. Um, So I assume that it's clear what I mean by that. If it's not, then ask me. Such that if lambda in I is minimal, then Fi mod Fi take away lambda is isomorphic to a direct sum of J lambdas. And remark no pun intended with standard, um, but nonetheless. So oh, excuse me. Uh, mm -hmm. Do we have an easy description of uh, the number of copies copies of J lambdas? Uh, in a second, we will see a very beautiful um, description, um, but in general, no. So for, for certain Wakimoto filtered objects, then yes, but in general, no. Thanks.
So, I will move on in a second. So the exercise gives us, um, so we have this uh, admits a unique and this filtration is functorial. So we have a functor which is kind of associated graded of the Wakimoto filtration. So GRUR A to, so this explains the notation, okay, which is associated graded of Wakimoto filtration. And it's easy to see Essentially, just because if I have a Wakimoto filtration on F and I have a Wakimoto filtration on G, then the tensor, the tensor product of the two filtrations gives me a Wakimoto filtration on, um, on the tensor product that Gruer is a tensor functor. Okay. Um, I'm tempted just to go for another five minutes or so. Um, just to explain kind of where this is all coming from in the, on, the, on the coherent side. Uh, so maybe we'll have our tea break a little bit later today. So this is motivational interlude. So we have the coherent side. G check, B check, etc. And um, any G check module, V, let's say finite dimensional, has a, well, I mean, we don't need finite dimensional has a filtration filtration by B check modules indexed by upper closed subsets in in namely so we think about b checkers moving the weights up and so we can just define vi to be the direct sum of the weight spaces And this is a B check sub module. And V I mod V V I without Lambda is isomorphic to a direct sum of one dimensional modules if lambda is minimal. In I. So this should look extremely analogous to what we've just seen for Wakimoto sheets. Uh, and in fact, so 
for SL2, you know, if my module has weights two, zero, minus two, zero, two, then my filtration kind of takes this and takes, then takes this. This would be my filtration. Um, and in fact, um, dot, so all um, X groups from K lambda to K mu is zero unless lambda is less than mu. And similarly, On n tilde, um, hom co g check in n tilde from O lambda to O mu is zero unless so the equivalence. Mapping okay, so this this slide is meant to show you a concrete instance in which we have very similar phenomena, um, and this concrete instance is not a coincidence it 's in fact the other side of um, this occupy basal Kamnikov equivalence. Uh, can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, can you go back to the page where uh, you define A and grow A? Ah, yes, here. Yeah. So you said that, uh, so, so A is the sub, uh, uh, the uh, full subcategory with objects uh, that are Makimoto Maki filter object, objects, right? Mm -hmm. uh, is it easy to see that, uh, so uh, if uh, given any morphism between two objects with, uh, with, uh, with Wakimoto filtration, uh, this morphism must respect the, uh, the Wakimoto uh, uh, filtrations? Yes, yeah, so that's, um, so, um, so that's part of the exercise, which is to show that it's a functorial filtration. But let me explain um, why. Uh, wait, uh, so, uh, so the exercise, so you said that uh, that's part, so, so the morphism must respect the, the unique fil filtration you just said. Yes. Do you, should, do you want me to try to explain why? Uh, no, no, I, I will try, try, um, try okay. by myself and if I can't solve it, I'll ask again. Uh, also, uh, there's another question uh, related to Joe's question. I'm not sure that if uh, he wanted to ask this too. Uh, so can you go to that page? So with uh, the lambda plus mu sufficiently dominant that page. So. Yeah, uh, no, wait. Yeah, that's here. Uh, yes. So uh, I understand what you explained uh, to Joe, uh, but you said another sentence, but you didn't write it down. So you said uh, uh, that uh, the, the thing on the right uh, is the known fact about Bru had order if lambda plus gamma and the mu, if both lambda plus gamma and mu plus gamma are sufficiently sufficiently dominant, but shouldn't mm -hmm. it be enough if both of them are dominant? Or yes. We, yeah. So. Uh, uh, so be, um, I'm a hundred percent sure it's correct for sufficiently dominant. Um, I would need to think if it's true for dominant. Yeah, I have another, <laughs> another question. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so, so the exercise gives us a functor from A to grow A. So is it also part of the exercise uh, to prove 
to prove that uh, any morphism uh, in A, uh, yes, I, I guess that that's also so, uh, that's also part of the because you you, you mentioned that a uh, girl A is not a full sub category, so we also need to prove that uh, the morphism in, morphisms are mapped to mo yes. morphisms in girl A, and that's also part of the exercise, that's right? Yes. And another way of saying it is that Gura A consists of direct sums of scalar multiples of identity morphisms. Yeah.
Okay, so now, um, due to some, um, so I, th I decided it's, it's not good to call them gates crease central, central sheaves, so I want to start calling them valence and gate three Kotwitz. Central sheaves. So this, this part of the lecture will just be a kind of summary of some big results and they're just extremely beautiful. Um, ah, so B, G, K. So there exists a, we, we've seen this, we've seen this um, theorem um, several times before. I'm also running slightly low on time, so um, there's some things in the notes that I won't cover. And I might just mention verbally in case anyone is interested. So there exists a central functor from Rep G check, which is equivalent by the Sataki isomorphism to perv G of O on the affine Grassmannian to P I Fle. So Gruer is as usual the affine Grassmannian. And um, in the language of last time, the image is convolution exact. I just wanted to make contact with the language we we're using last time. So this is the statement. We've discussed this a few times. In order to discuss centrality, you want to say that A tensor B is canonically isomorphic to B tensor A. But um, the, it's very important that that isomorphism takes place in perverse sheaves. And for that to happen, um, A tends to the image of this functor, it better be um, perverse for all A. In other words, it's convolution exact. Um, and moreover, so this functor is called Z. with a tensor derivation N which is um, log of monodromy So this is constructed by nearby cycles and the nearby cycles has this monodromy endomorphism, which gives us this, um, this is a nil potent. Okay. So a remark that I won't write down is that there's an awful lot of different compatibilities that need to check, be checked um, for this to be a central functor. And these are also very important in Archipop Ezra Kamnikov proof, and they are proved um, in some degree of difficulty in an appendix called Braiding Compatibilities by Gates Gree to a paper of uh, Ezra Kamnikov called Tensor Categories Associated to Cells in Affine Biogroups. Um, and this level of de detail is multiplied by about 10 in a recent book in progress by Acharish. Okay. So, Uh, so that remark is in the notes if you're interested. Um, now for the next result, which is really uh, remarkable, um, it's the analog, it's the affine analog of Merkovich's observation. We need to extend the definition of Wakimoto sheaves.
So we define JW to be J lambda tensor nabla of WF where W is T lambda times WF, where this is in the planet arc. I mean, I just want to use this notation in the following theorem and then forgot that I, forget that I ever knew this notation. So I don't want to call these JW Akimoto sheaves, for example. So the analog of Merkovich's observation So this is the affine analog of Merkovich is, is the following theorem in Akipov as Rukhamikov, which is A, any convolution exact F in any convolution exact I equivariant perverse sheaf on the affine flag variety is kind of generalized Wakimoto filtered. And the proof of this statement is pretty analogous to Merkovich's proof. And B, If in addition, F is kind of weakly central, I F tensor G is isomorphic to G tensor F for all equivariant perversities G, then F is Wakimoto filtered. Uh, so the proof of A is analogous as to Merkovich's observation. The proof of B is essentially a growth in the group calculation. Just to rule out, if you have any JW that um, If you have any JW for W not in the root lattice in the in the in the co-root lattice, then can't possibly be um, central for growth and root reasons. So I only J lambda for lambda. Now, um, the corollary, which is why we care about this, is the remarkable statement that Z of some element in the Sataki category is Wakimoto filtered. So i.e. our functor z, we can regard it as being a functor from PGO to Wakimoto filtered. Such a nice statement, it gets a double blue. Uh, so now, why is this so, so such a compelling statement? Um, one of the reasons is that in the decategorified story, in Bernstein's description of the center, you first describe the Bernstein generators, and then you say, that the center is symmetric functions in the Bernstein generator, symmetric 
Laurent polynomials in the Bernstein generators. So the image of this functor Z should be considered as the analog of the Bernstein center. And this is saying that it kind of lives in the Bernstein generators. Okay, so there's plenty to be excited about at the moment. Here's another thing to be excited about. Okay, so I mean, the, the, just the summary is the, cent, the, the Bernstein center, the, the central functor lands in Wakimoto filters. So the following uh, bears a striking resemblance to Merkovich Vilonen's theorem on weight functors. Uh, it's the following theorem. So we've just seen that, so it has two parts, has a very beautiful part and a, for me, still a little bit incomprehensible part. Um, so we have the central functor. that lands in Wakimoto filtered things inside PI. And now we have rep T and we have this tensor functor to Gruer A. So these are both tensor functors. And now we have associated graded of, of Wakimoto filtration here. And here we have forget, I restrict. And the statement is that this um, diagram commutes. Up to natural isomorphism. Uh, B, the B statement, um, maybe it's worth just stating it um, so that someone can explain to me that it's obvious for some reason. Um, so recall that the N K orbits on Fleur are parameterized by W. And given W inside here, I denote by S W the corresponding NK orbit and Iota W the inclusion into Fleur. So these are the analogues of the of the S nu in uh, Merkovich Filona. The S nu or the T nu, I can never remember which one goes which, which one is which. But um, so th this is for the experts. So what we can do is we can take compactly supported cohomology of iota w upper star of z of Sataki of v. So v is a representation of g check. So what we look what we look like we're doing is doing a Merkovich Villon and weight functor, but up, upstairs in the upper and flag variety. And the statement is that this is 
is the canonically the weight space if w equals nu is a co-weight and i equals length of nu and zero otherwise so remember that the one of the key points in merkovich velonen's proof of this is the statement that we can see this restriction functor in terms of weight functors and what this theorem is saying is that we can also see the restriction functor once we we can kind of do an arrow like this uh, so there's really there's really a striking resemblance so remark to MV. Um, so um, According to Archibald Bezrakamnikov, and I haven't understood why, if you know this theorem, then you get the uh, merkovich vilonen theorem on weight functors, and conversely. Okay, so now we have um, all, our in all the ingredients that we want to define our, I should have said that this is just NK. So now we have all the ingredients to define our functor in the Archibald's Recovery Theorem. So let's do it. If there's no questions on this slide. Um, what is NX? Ah, uh, sorry, NK. So this oh. is the, um, yeah, this is like, nk of c is n of c this is so for gln it's like upper triangular matrices with laurent series entries All right, thanks okay so now um We've got everything and we, we just put it together and then we get our functor by Tanakian formalism. So what I'll try and do is write in black what we've got and then um, in blue or something philosophically what it corresponds to. So what we want, um, so the functor roughly should go from vector bundles on n tilde to equivariant sheets. This is roughly where we want our functor to go. So maybe I can put this in blue. This is very um, impressionistic, but such is life. Uh, so what are our ingredients? We have our central functor. From Rep G check to A. And this is the BGK. Central functor. Uh, 
Uh, the next bit of structure we have is we have another functor from rep t check to a. This is um, to grew a, and this is remember non-full. This is given by Wakimoto. So I'll just list everything and then I'll say philosophically what it corresponds to. Um, we have N, our null potent tensor de derivation. Of Z. This is um, log of monodromy. We have B lambda. So perhaps it's totally disappeared, but we needed, so remember. So if we take a highest weight representation and we consider its Wakimoto filtration, it has a filtration um, in kind of decreasing order in the roots. And so it has a highest weight term. And this is our, this is um, highest weight in Wakimoto filtration. Okay, if we take the associated graded, so Lin Wan asked before, if we take the associated graded of this, what are the multiplicities that we get? And the beautiful theorem that I stated on the previous slide is telling us that these multiplicities are weight multiplicities. In particular, the lowest Wakimoto term occurs with multiplicity one, and we have a canonical arrow here, and that's our B lambda. Now, philosophically, what do these correspond to? Our central functor corresponds to point mod G check to PI. Rep T check to Gruer A corresponds to um, coherent cheese on base affine space. to PI. The nil potent tensor derivation corresponds to coherent sheaves on G check mod G check to PI. And this corresponds to um, some relation between G check mod U check and okay. So metaphorically, what we're thinking about is the fact that n tilde is a closed sub variety inside flags times the Lie algebra and the fact that this is cut out by equations is telling us that there's some relation between these two factors. So this is metaphorically, I mean, these are very closely related and these are very closely related. And uh, I just want to briefly go over what we need to check. Um, so some of this we've seen that we need to check it. So we need to check the Plucker relations. So the Plucker relations. So 
So we have this data and we just need to check two things about this data, namely the Plucker relations, which tell us that um, the, we have the following diagram. We can take a tensor product of these two arrows. And this gives us, goes to Z of V lambda tensor V mu, which is canonically, this is a tensor functor. And now I have Z of M lambda mu, which is the projection onto the unique highest weight term. And then this is canonically isomorphic to G lambda plus mu. And I want this diagram to commute. But it's kind of remarkable that this is just, it's basically obvious that this diagram commutes. Because, um, so if I take a Wakimoto filtration here and a Wakimoto filtration here, this is the inclusion of the highest weight bit inside this Wakimoto filtration. And the Wakimoto filtration commutes with the tensor product. And so when I, it's basically saying, the highest term in the Wakimoto filtration is simply the tensor product of the highest, um, highest terms of its factors. And this is, um, so this is immediate. B this is something that I haven't explained at all um, so you just have to take it on faith that we need to check it so we need to show that um, So this goes to the central functor applied to V lambda. This is my B lambda arrow. And now I apply N lambda. I apply my nilpotent tensor derivation. And I want that this is zero. Very roughly speaking, you can see this relation is cutting out the scheme um, N tilde inside G check times space affine space. Um, proof of this. I'm just doing these two proofs because it's, it's for me totally remarkable how we, we use only the kind of softest things about our situation to check these. So ZV lambda has a Wakimoto filtration. So I'll draw an egg diagram as, as usual. So it's a little bit confusing, but the, 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 the Wakimoto corresponding to the highest weight vector occurs at the bottom. Now, because hom j lambda j mu is zero to mu less than lambda, so there's no maps back. So I have this nilpotent endomorphism. This says where can where can j lambda 
land? Where can this submodule land? It can't land anywhere up here because all of these homs are zero. So what this says is that NV lambda preserves J lambda. But NV lambda nilpotent plus end of J lambda is Q implies that N V lambda is zero on J lambda. Okay. okay, so first we argued that in this egg diagram it has to preserve this thing that's a little bit like the sockle, so it has to map it into itself. Uh, am I constantly frozen? Okay. Okay, there's quite a few not here's in one, so I'm not sure if you can hear this, but. So, okay, so this nilpotent endomorphism has to preserve this thing a little bit like the sockle. It's not the sockle, but some submodule. And it has to act as a scalar on that submodule. And because it's nilpotent, that scalar has to be zero. Okay, and that, that being zero is the same thing as the fact that this diagram is zero. Okay. So I'll just spend one slide um, being moderately incomprehensible. And I don't want anyone to say that that's in stark contrast to normal. Uh, and then I want to declare that, um, that we have a functor, we have the desired functor, and then next week, I want to check that it's an equivalence, that it induces a, an equivalence on the antispherical module. So here's our diagram. So this is a So we, we want to produce a functor from G, G check equivariant sheaves on here to the uh, equivariant perverse sheaves. That's difficult to do because this is projective. And so we move to a setting in which this is almost affine. This is what I explained in some detail two weeks ago. This is base affine space. And this is almost affine, so this sits open inside where this is the affine closure of base affine space. And now our first instinct would be just to close this up inside here to get an affine variety. But what uh, Akipov Bezri Kovnikov explained is that this is not quite the right thing to do. You should take a different affine variety, which they denote n tilde hat half, which this is also open inside. And for the def of half. See Archipop as Rukavnikov. Uh, yeah, so I actually did prepare a lecture on this, but uh, probably won't give it. Um, so the above data gives so the point is that this is given by very simple equations inside here. And these equations can be interpreted in a, sorry, very simple equations inside here. These equations can be interpreted in a Tanakian like way, and we get exactly this um, nilpotent endomorphism of B lambda being zero condition. 
So the above data gives us a functor from, so Tanaki formalism, or maybe one should say Tanaki formalism on drugs, because it's a fair bit of it. Co free G check. Um, N so basically the data that um, and the relations that we just checked gives us a functor from here to A. So we get a functor from the homotopy category to the homotopy category of A. That's purely formal. And now comes a step that needs about four pages in Archibald Bezrekovnikov, so it's by no means trivial, um, which is that the complexes with um, on the boundary of N to check are mapped to zero and plus a cyclic complexes go to zero and so what we end up with is db co G check of N, sorry. To, um, I mean, the, um, so this has a natural map to KB of PI. And now there's a realization functor, which we've discussed before, to DB of PI. Uh, sorry, no, just the, nothing, sorry, nothing complicated. This is just the local, the functor to the derived category. So DB PI. But now this is a, um, this is just the quotient by T check. And so this becomes DB co G check in tilde. And I can compose with the realization functor. So I get DB PI. And then next week, the composition with the map from um, di fl to antispherical is an equivalence. Okay, so. At the end of the day, we get our equivalence, which is the Archibald Fraser recovery Cup theorem. I just want to give an example. Um, 
to tie back to lecture um, 23. So this slide is very, um, very many concepts and Yeah, so Peter says, I don't understand the Taki Tanaki informalism bit, um, which is this step. But I did spend about um, three lectures trying to explain this in particular examples. So for example, this is the statement that, um, that was at the end of one lecture, which is that to give um, a functor from um, coherent cheese on G check mod on the Lie algebra G check mod G is essentially equivalent to giving a tensor derivation of your functor. Um, these kind of statements. I mean like this, this is the um, absolute most work in all of this. This is the most difficult bit and this is the kind of key realization of Bezrakovikov, but I did spend um, quite a lot of time trying to explain this. Possibly not succeeding, but at the very least I've tried. It would be clearer if I knew what n tilde hat f i was. So just to give you, just to give you a very um, brief idea of what um, n tilde hat affine is. So what's, what are the functions on it? It's um, O of G check tensored with, so, so it's, it's a closed subvariety inside um, inside here, and this is direct sum of V lambda, where this has the Chevalier multiplication. Um, and now you can imagine that there's some, whoops, that there's some very canonical elements sitting inside here, um, which define an ideal. And that ideal describes this thing. And that ideal is explicit enough that you can hope to um, relate it to the relations that I just checked. So perhaps um, I will through laziness and lack of lack of time, I can just show you this example. So this is the example that we saw of the central sheaf, gates free central sheaf of the natural representation of GL2, and this was um, back in lecture 23. So this is meant to be a picture of the affine flag variety. Yeah. I think you'll all agree that the affine flag variety is definitely blue. Uh, and inside this affine flag variety, you have the base point. And then we have these two Schubert curves corresponding to the two simple reflections. These are the two kind of canonical P1s inside the affine flag variety, and they meet transversely. And this central sheaf is supported on this intersection. And as a perverse sheaf, it looks like this. So this we computed. Now, uh, what I'm asking you to believe is that the red thing is the Wakimoto filtration. So we see two, two um, Wakimoto factors, which is the, the fact that um, the natural representation has dimension two, and they're arranged like this. And here's our highest weight, um, here's our highest weight Wakimoto thing at the bottom. Um, we have this nilpotent tensor derivation 
which maps the, ide the identity up to here and the identity down to here. And the key um, thing that we checked is that, the, that this nilpotent derivation annihilates this highest weight Wakimoto sub. Um, I find this example extremely helpful. So if you're trying to digest this at some future point and, um, and are stuck, then I'd really recommend thinking about this example. And after next week, when we finish the proof of Archipov bezra um, I will go through this example in the world of Zogel bimodules where it's also very, very nice. <laughs>